left eye to the right eye by Monday, and uh, now it's gone back to the left eye. So it, it is it is very difficult for me to see, and uh, because I wear contacts, I shared this on Sunday night. I wear contacts, and they're monovision lenses, and that means that. The one on the left is for up close, for my reading. And the one on the right is for distance. And uh, so anyway, of course, it's the one on my left for reading that I'm having problems with. And um, so hopefully, hopefully that stuff will clear up. Well, it's election time. Yeah. And we are going to elect disciples, okay? Um, just, give some back there to our, to our guys the I, I got with you. <laughs> she just got here in time to help out. Everybody, does everybody have a pen or a pencil? This, I hope you're going to enjoy this. If you uh, were here Sunday night, we talked about the church just being a building. Is that right? Is that what we said? What I said Sunday night that church is just a building? Did I say that? That's right. <laughs> That's what I said. And uh, last um, uh, and let's see. None of you ladies were here. But um, I shared a painting that my niece did when she was eight weeks. No, she wasn't. She was eight years old. <laughs> she was very talented at eight weeks. Uh, but she, uh, um, she did a painting for me and for Paul, and it was a church. And uh, there was a, there was a, a heart on the church doors. There, there was the cross. They, she had a rainbow over the church, and um, then she had dark, dark clouds, purplish black clouds on one side over the church, over a lot of the church. And then she had on this, on the left side of the church, she had, or looking at it, she had the, uh, you know, it was pretty clear. It was, you know, sunny and everything. And we talked about what those different things meant. And uh, I think the, the first person, Loretta, I believe, was the first person that brought out about the heart and how that in the church, uh, we need to show a heart of love to people as they come in. People are hurting, and they come to, to church and it may be people that have been coming for years on a regular basis, and we don't know when people are hurting, and uh, because a lot of times people just kind of keep it to themselves. But we need to really have a heart of love for people. And then we talked about how there was the rainbow and how God sent that rainbow as a promise. And, you know, the thing of it is, when we some of the worst storms that we can have, we have the prettiest rainbows with those. And then we talked about the dark, dark clouds and the things that that we see, you know, that come in our lives, some of the, the stress, the illnesses, all these things that come through. There it is. And, uh, and see, she had written on there that she was thanking me and Paul, Uncle Paul, for taking her. Now, you can't see it, but down to the left of the cross, there are three people there. That's me and Paul and Allie, my niece. Yeah, and she was thanking us. And up in the other part, she thanked us for taking her to church. And that really spoke to me. And um, and when I, you know, I thought, I thought it was wonderful. I took it home and put it up on my wall. And I don't know, it must have been a year or so later that um, Pastor called, Pastor uh, Meek called me and uh, asked me on Monday night if I would do the service on Wednesday. And I said, uh, okay. 
<laughs> and that, and I thought, what am I going to do? And the next morning, as I was getting ready to leave work, it was cool, and I had turned around to open the closet door to get my coat out, and my eyes just went right on that picture. And it, and I thought, that's it. So we talked about the church, and the church is the people. And uh, so anyway, where we're going tonight is we're going to elect disciples. Now, I'm going, you've got a ballot, and I'm going to read to you information about these disciples, okay? And when I get done, I'll tell you when you, and you're not going to have any names on here yet, okay? But when you get down, when I get to that part to say vote, you, you either put an X or check mark in the yes box or no, for yes, you would vote for that person or no, you would not. Now remember, you're basing it on what I'm telling you. Okay. <clears throat> Um, let me see, I don't want to start. Okay, I'm not going to show you any pictures, so you just have to kind of visualize because I don't want to. But this this first candidate, okay, um, he's, um, he's just come up from the beach. He's got out of a fishing boat. And uh, anyway, he's probably really dirty. He probably smells like fish. And he's just uh, entered middle age, but he's already bald. And uh, the fringes of hair that remain are already gray. His hands are rough and calloused. His fingers are strong. He smells of fish. He's a very uncouth person. Not at all refined or cultured or educated. He's a blustering, blundering, clumsy, impulsive person. He doesn't strike us as being material for the ministry, but, you know... Maybe he is. His age may be against him. Maybe he's too old. But we we really got to think about this. This is all we can. We we are visualizing this man. And uh, the thing of it is, too, he can be a stubborn person. He can be very rough. He can. He's lived a rough life. So based on that, well, actually, I probably should add something else to it too. Is He's a big fisherman, and sometimes he can be very easily provoked into profanity. So you never know what you might hear come out of his mouth. But anyway, so can you imagine this big fisherman as a disciple? Um, if so, check X, or put an X mark, or check in yes. And if you don't think he is a good one, then put no. Okay, now I'm going to really talk about two and three together, okay? Uh, these next two candidates, numbers two and three, are brothers, and um, they, uh, they're, they're fishermen, but, and they actually came from the same village uh, from, as the first one I talked to you about, but uh, they were strong men and they worked with their hands for a living, but they had they they were a little bit more refined, maybe. Um, they they were not social snobs or anything like that. But anyway, um, the Lord Himself, you know, really was a carpenter, and they were a carpenter. So you know, they it could be that they did some manual labor. But anyway. Um, they had, uh, uh, they probably wouldn't have minded having anybody come into their home. They were pretty wealthy, and still because they were doing a lot of different things, and uh, so they're they're kind of looking at you right now. Maybe they've come in and, and they're going to make a speech about how they think that they should be uh, elected as a disciple, and their eyes are steady, and uh, so anyway, they they can look at you and make you feel comfortable or they can make you maybe feel a little uncomfortable. And they know the signs of the sudden squalls and all the things, so they're not ignorant about anything. 
and they have strong hands and nimble fingers. They make quite a, a team, these two brothers. In fact, it's a mystery to their comp competitors how they always manage to find the fish, always catch more than the other boats, and how they manage to get better prices for their catch. So anyway, we are down to that point, and maybe I should tell you they're boastful. Um, they can irritate people, and um, anyway, they've earned for themselves the nickname the Sons of Thunder because they are always rumbling about something. The way they feel, they have little patience with people who cross them, and they would be inclined to call down fire from heaven to burn them up if they could. So, those are the two um, candidates now that are brothers. And uh, see if you think you would vote yes. And so, vote for um, one of them in, on line two and the other one on line three. Okay? Now, we're going to go to the next candidate. And... Uh, it's kind of a wild gleam in his eyes. The reason why is he's the leader of the underground. He seems to be the fanatical type. He's very impatient, but he can be nervous. He can't keep his hands still. His fingers, they're just, they just go, they clench. You know, that's, that's just a sign sometimes something's really bothering them. They're, they're ready to do something and you don't know what it might be. And sometimes they, his hands want to reach up and haul down the hated penance of Rome that hang in desecration from the walls of old Jerusalem. His blood fairly boils when he's forced by some clanking legionnaire to make way on the pavement and step into the gutter. He dreams of the day when the kingdom shall be restored to Israel and the promise of the sacred writings when the Messiah comes, he, he'll, he's going to come to restore the kingdom. His eyes dance at the thought of the Messiah, at the head of a liberating army, driving the hatred Romans into the sea. Yes, from the hill country they could come, and from the cellars of the holy city they would rise up to bring back the glories of David and Solomon. He wants more than life itself to be a part of that glorious campaign but he might be a little too dangerous. He is highly inflammable material. So would you vote yes or no for number four? Now let's go to number five. Oh, oh we're seeing this man come in and let's lock up. The ladies are greeting this guy because you know, they're, they're obviously, the ladies that are seeing him obviously going to get their vote because he is very handsome. He walks with an easy grace. There's nothing effeminate about him, but he's gentle, refined, every inch a gentleman, endowed with all the social graces, who could possibly say a word against him? His eyes are like limpid pools. I can just see it, can't you? Those eyes with a real kind of light blue. Yeah, you can see it, can't you? His smile melts their heart, but when he starts the day, it's not to take up the tools of his trade, for he has none. It is not to yoke the oxen to work in the fields, for he never soils his hands. It's to wonder, is to wander off to daydream. He likes to smell the flowers. He's an introvert. He's a dreamer. He has no skills. He just wants to sit and dream. So, would you vote no or yes for number five? Okay, now we're going to go on to another one, and he is a fisherman. So, you know, we've already talked about some fishermen. But um, anyway, he 
uh, he has, um, if you don't have any of these things, like he doesn't, he's not a farmer, he doesn't, he doesn't grow trees or anything like that, he doesn't have any sheep or goats, so maybe this is just the only thing that he really wants to do. Um, well, people have to eat fish, and at that time, fish is the best money crop in that part of the country. This man must have it in him to be a disciple. He is not impulsive by any means. He will not be swept off his feet. He is very cautious, slow to convince. But you have to show him. He demands proof for everything. He'll take nothing on faith. Now this twist of mind and character uh, will always slow up the work of any group to which he might belong. He will be like the rusty little tramp steamer in the convoy. He'll slow down and the other is to his own wheezy seven or eight knots. In fact, he has only two speeds, dead slow and stop. Can you imagine him as a member of the apostolic band? Answer yes or no. Number six. Plus, okay, then the next one. Now, if we were Jews living at the time the disciples were originally chosen, um, we probably would be booing and hissing at this candidate, but see how you'll do today. For he is a quizzling. He has sold out the army of occupation, of occupation and is collecting taxes for the Roman government. Tax collectors are seldom the most popular men in any community, and this fellow is a racketeer to boot. He has devised his own particular racket and is making him many enemies and making him rich as well. That's not all. He has a mind like an adding machine. He's been counting money all his life. Money and evidence of wealth alone impress him. That's bad enough, but there's worse to come. He's a genealogist. He is one of those men whose fa passion is family trees. He'll bore you with long recitals of the best families, where they came from, whom they married, how many children they had, and who they married, and so on. So... He can be very smart, he's a racketeer, which means who knows who he's been around, but he can try to entertain you too with his all of his stories. Okay, so what do you think about this man? It's number seven, go ahead and vote. Now the next one, um, actually, his name's Andrew. No one really knows anything about him. I mean, you know, if you're going to vote for him now, you don't know anything about him. You haven't heard about him. He doesn't have any personality at all, whatever that means. And um, so he is actually Peter's brother. Um, so that's all we know about him. We don't know what kind of skills he has. We don't, know, we don't know whether he could be a good disciple, if he could lead a group. We don't know anything about him. So uh, vote, yes or no, for Andrew, number eight. Okay, the next four, or the last four, we really don't know at this point anything about them. They're waiting to see if they're going to be called or if anybody's interested in them. And so number nine is Bartholomew. Number 10 is Thaddeus. Number 11 is Philip. And number 12 is another James, a man called 
and and a, and a and a man called Simon from Canaan. Um, they're interested in becoming disciples, but we don't know anything about their skills, about what they're able to do. So you've got those last four, nine through twelve. So vote on them based on what I've just told you. Everybody done? These men were not out trying to get a position as a disciple. They were called by Jesus. And after hearing that and hearing what they were like, did Jesus make it a point to go and get every person that believed in him and was going to live for him? He knew beyond any doubt? No. Now, would we elect people like that to head positions in the church? No, we wouldn't. Because of the fact that they have to learn. First of all, they have to they have to have knowledge of what the purpose is. What are we as Christian leaders supposed to be doing? How how are we allowing God to use us? Disciples who answered God's call left everything to travel by his side. And you know when you when you read that, when you when you know that, um did these men even know Jesus before he came up and started talking to them? It doesn't really say. He approached them. But what did they do? They stopped what they were doing and followed him. Their mission was not only to learn Jesus' message and carry it to the people after he was gone, but to form a community of believers living the life which Jesus preached. They renounced their worldly goods and lived pure and rustic lives among the poor, the sick, and the outcasts of the world. And Jesus called, you know, of course, we know that he called the two fishermen who were brothers. We know he called them. And they stopped what they were doing. And all of them, it wasn't like, well, I have to think about this, Jesus. I don't know. What, what are you going to use me for? I mean, they could have they could have doubted. They could have said, I don't know really that I want. I don't even know who you are. You could, you, could, you could run me right into trouble somewhere. I mean, how trustful would we be of someone if we were like, I'm at work and somebody, if they could get back to where I am, which they couldn't without, you know, signing a paper or something and showing identity, they couldn't get back to where I am. But say they did. And they said, I want you to come with me. I'm going, no, I don't think so. You know, I wouldn't get up and follow a total stranger someplace. I mean, we there, we know too many things that happen today that are, are horrible things. But the thing of it is, these men, and this is the point I'm trying to make, we talked about, you know, that uh, we we need to be following what the the apostles, what the disciples did, what the prophets preached, and uh, and I was actually talking. Uh, I think I mentioned that I work with several people who are um, who are Christians, and the one that I mentioned that is from Nigeria. Um, this this afternoon, we were kind of, some of us were just kind of talking, taking a little break, and and. Uh, and I was telling them about um, how, you know, what I had said about that nowadays, some of the things we say, we, I wonder if, if we're not being too careful about uh, being bold to speak out for Jesus and say, you know, he is the truth and the life. And, and you know, nobody can come. Nobody can come from him. 
except, except by him. And the thing of it is, is that, you know, we need to trust in him. And what he, what Jesus said and what God says to us, and, and I said, we, we need not be afraid of being bold to people. But I think as Christians, we're getting to that point where we're very careful about saying to someone, you really need to turn your heart and life over to the Lord and ask him to come into your heart and forgive you of your sins. And when somebody does that you know, and just say, you know, ask God to forgive you of your sins, he's going to do it if you just ask him and you live that life. And then we start talking to him about sanctification and how they need, that's just that's a continuing process. You just you can, you know, come to the altar and be sanctified, but it's a continuing process, you know, that you're just asking God just completely, you know, enter into my life and give you know, teach me holiness, teach me how to live for you. And if I've done something wrong, forgive me and, and show me that. That's the way we need to do, but we're so careful about how we address people with this to the point where, and I, I've even mentioned this the other night, is now a lot of ministers, and I'm not saying it's wrong, I just, for me personally, to say someone's come to faith, they're not even saying, you know, that they, they've surrendered their life to the Lord, they've asked Jesus to come into their heart, they've come to faith. You could be talking about anybody, you go out here on the street and around this road and say, hey, do you have faith in God? Well, most of them would say, well, sure, absolutely. But are they living a Christian life? So this, you know, these were things. But what I, um, what I want to do is now let you know. And so you can put these. I'm going to give them to you in the order that I gave it to you. Um, and you can see. Um, and I'm not going to ask you. And you don't. But just don't change your vote after I tell you this, okay? <laughs> just leave it. But see, you know, how, how do we feel? when we're with other people, um, you know, are we willing to go to them and say, I'd love to invite you to church. You know, I'd like to talk with, to you about the Lord. Jesus basically went to them and said, follow me. And, you know, as Christians, people should really See in their see us see Jesus in our lives and want to, you know, maybe live the kind of life that we're living and and uh, say, you know, I, I need to experience what you're experiencing. But the first one, Jesus walking by the Sea of Galilee, saw Simon called Peter, and then I mentioned Andrew later on. But we're going to talk about Peter right now <clears throat> that they were out um, on their ship and. And he called them, uh, and I'm not going to read all this because there's a lot. I love I love this book and this all this information. But it says in here, according to tradition, Peter was martyred in Rome in A.D. 61. <clears throat> the story is told that Peter tried to flee the city when his arrest appeared imminent, but a vision of Jesus entering Rome to be crucified again, this time in Peter's place, convinced the disciple to return to his own death. Peter requested that he be crucified head down as he felt unworthy um, to die in the same position as Jesus. To the end, Peter was guided by his emotional yet passionate devotion to his Christ. And, you know, we all really um, like to read about Peter um, you know he was very impulsive and he might do one thing one time and the other time just like when Jesus was arrested we know Peter just he was um, he was a very emotional person he um, and impulsive we, you know when you read about him it's like what's he going to do next but anyway that's Peter and <clears throat> so uh, I'm like I say I'm not going to ask you what how you voted but um, you know it'd be interesting to see if you're basing it on what you heard, what, what your decision was. <clears throat> and then the next one was John. And, um, and of course, he was uh, the, the two brothers that were there, I think. But in, and later in life on the Isle of Patmos, and, and some of this that it may be new to you, uh, in the town of Ephesus, legends emerge of John as a man of peace 
and quiet devotion. One story is particularly uh, interesting, I think. Old, it's old and weak. He was, he was old and he was weak. John was still a beloved teacher in the church at Ephesus. He became almost too weak to speak and answered all questions with Jesus' admonition that we love one another. When questioned as to why he uttered only those words, John replied that love was the heart of Jesus' message. One of the sons of thunder, who in his youth had been quick to anger, had come to believe in love above all else. So he was one of the two, the two brothers. Then Andrew, the third one, uh, and actually I think I had you list the brothers two and three, so if you want to skip down to four for Andrew. But um, anyway, centuries after his death, Andrew's memory continued to inspire people. One legend tells of an 8th century monk who had a vision that he was to take Andrew's remains to the west. The monk ended his journey in Scotland where he founded St. Andrew's Church. Soldiers from the area fighting a battle against the English reported that they saw and were guided by the cross of St. Andrew shining in the sky above the battlefield. Today, Andrew is the patron saint of Russia, Greece, and Scotland. The disciples who carried on his mission, the disciple who carried on his mission quietly and often in the shadows continued to represent Christ to the world. See, these are things, you know, we can read all about these disciples and what they did, as well, but these are, I think, very interesting uh, bits of information. Then Thomas, well, what, how, how do we, what do we always add to Thomas's name? Doubting Thomas, right. <laughs> Doubt alone is not the story of Thomas. It is the answer Jesus provides. The resolution of Tom's doubt, Thomas's doubt, that is instructive. Jesus does not condemn Thomas for expressing doubts which arise from a desire for more complete understanding, nor does he try to persuade Jesus as, as himself. He says, I am the way. And one legend concerning Thomas, although its authenticity is, you know, is not of, of any assurance here, but nevertheless demonstrates uh, the disciples' personality. After Christ's resurrection, Thomas was supposedly assigned the ministry of India by the group of disciples. Thomas refused to go, doubtful that he would carry Jesus' message to this foreign land. Jesus appeared to him in a vision, however, calmed his doubts and convinced Thomas to go. The legend continues that once in India, Thomas became a man of great inspirational faith. Time, true or not, the legend emphasizes the lesson of Thomas's life. Doubt and pessimism in mankind are natural, but deep faith in Christ reveals that through God, what all things are possible. And then let's go to Matthew. Once chosen as a disciple, Matthew proved truly faithful and desired to spread the good word immediately. Evidence of his faith exists in the use he made of one of the tools of his former trade, his pen. Blessed with the skill of writing, Matthew left a record of life and teachings of Jesus. Although scholars dispute how much of the book of Matthew in the Bible canon was actually written by Matthew, it is certain that he wrote about Jesus and thus was instrumental in bringing countless people to Christianity. Jesus called Matthew to repentance. Matthew answered, and his life was transformed. And then, of course, we have Judas Iscariot. Accounts of Judas' downfall after the betrayal differ in their details. In the book of Matthew, Judas immediately hangs himself. In the Acts of the Apostles, Judas buys a burial field with the 30 pieces of silver, then collapses and dies there. 
Whatever the circumstances, Judas could not live with the consequences of his act. Judas is an example of a person who could never fully accept Jesus as Lord. Like the rich young ruler, Judas could not relinquish his worldly life and commit himself to the Lord. When the time came to choose, he betrayed his Lord and lost his life in the process. And you know, you think how many people do we know today who just will not accept the Lord? No matter, and you know, but you never give up. I shared that about my two brothers. They did not give up. Then we have uh, two more. We have Philip. Philip from Bethsaida on the north co coast of the Sea of Galilee was the first disciple to hear the simple command, follow me, from Jesus. He answered the call and became a devoted missionary. Philip appears in the first three Gospels only in lists of as only in the list of the of the apostles. He comes to life, however, in the book of John. Philip's first act after hearing Jesus' call was to find Nathaniel and tell him the news that the Messiah, long promised by the prophets and by Moses, had come. Matthias was uh, Nathaniel was skeptical rather than uh, argue with him. He simply urged Nathaniel to go and see Jesus for himself. And sometimes that's a better thing to do, isn't it? Rather than argue with somebody, just say, well, you know, why don't you try reading about Jesus? Why don't you go, why don't you talk to God and, uh, and, and just see how much better you're going to feel about it. Uh, later, when a group of Greeks approached Philip in Jerusalem, hoping to be taken to meet Jesus, the disciples sought out Andrew, and together they took the Greeks to Jesus um, certain that the Greeks too would be overcome by faith in the presence of the master. A legend of Philip proves that the faith born in his first encounter with Christ remained his guiding light. Philip had been preaching in Heropolis and his church was composed of a large group of Christians. When sentenced to die by the leaders of Heropolis for his preaching, Philip did not just quietly accept his fate. <clears throat> At his execution, he called upon the ground to open up and swallow the thousands who looked upon him. At that, Jesus appeared to Philip and rebuked him. Calmed by the vision of the risen Christ, Philip accepted death and requested only that his body be wrapped in papyrus rather than linen, which was used to wrap the body of Christ. In this final act, Philip recalled the faith born out of his first step as a disciple when he heard the two words that would ever after guide his life, follow me. And then finally we have Simon. Simon, known both as Simon the Canaanite and Simon the Zealot, is mentioned only four times in the New Testament. In the Gospels of Matthew, Mark, and Luke, his name appears only as part of a list of apostles in the passage from Acts. We learn only that, that Simon remained with the disciples after Jesus' ascension. What little we know about the man Simon comes from his designation as a zealot. The zealot, zealots were a radical Jewish party that emerged after the death of Herod the Great. When Judea fell under the life, the rule of a Roman governor, zealots were devoted to strict adherence to Jewish law, which included the belief that God alone was their ruler. Their resistance to Roman rule was absolute and violent. Zealots were prepared to sacrifice their own lives and the lives of any who cooperated with the Roman government. For a zealot to become a disciple of Christ is then truly amazing. To follow Jesus, Simon had to lay down his weapons, quiet his anger, and pledge his belief in the sacrificial love of Jesus as the source of salvation. And I have uh, just one passage of scripture. It says um, in John, <clears throat> the 12th chapter, chapter, the 26th verse, If any man serve me, let him follow me. And where I am, 
there shall also my servant be. If any man serve me, him will my father honor. So we may feel like, I don't know whether I'm worthy of it. I don't know whether I am able to, to do things to reach out and be a disciple for Christ. But you know, when we go out into the world, we're called to be disciples, aren't we? And uh, I think it, the, one of the things I thought about as I, as I was doing this and I thought about doing the election with this is would I be someone that, that would be voted for if, some, if I was saying I'm, I'm actually a delegate uh, I want to be considered to be elected as a disciple would I get a yes vote because of my life the way I live my life and the way that people see Jesus in me or would I get a no because they don't see those things and they'd say she has no right to be a disciple and I think we just need to and you know we all uh, I shared this on uh, on Sunday night you know we don't always agree on everything you know there are going to be things but but the thing of it is is that when we think about our our church um, and and when I'm talking about the church that we would want to bring people into into this building this is a building a place that we worship but that we could reach out so that our church meaning the people would grow because we care enough to reach out and uh, if you remember Paul and I sang here I think five different revivals and um, and I did mention this Sunday evening, we had, every time we would leave, we would have such a burden for this church. And it was after that fifth revival in 2011 that we really felt God's call to come to Blennerhassett. And then, you know, when his mom got sick and and uh, we, you know, Paul said, that was home church to him, not so much me. I mean, I started when I was in the, I think I was 12 years old or something, started going to, to Broadway but with my aunt and uncle. But he grew up in, in that church, and he said, this is home church. And he said, and mom, his mom and dad were char charter members of the church. And he said, I'd just like to continue. I'd like to be there as long as she's able to come and be there. And uh, so, you know, time is, in those few years, there's been a lot that's happened. But, uh, uh, but God's, God's called me again. And, uh, and, and you know, and I, I love this church. I love the people. And uh, I hope we all feel that way about each other. Sometimes we, you know, we may have some differences. We may have some things we're discouraged about or anything. But, you know, we all have an ability, a talent. We have something that we can, that, that we can use to work for Jesus and be his follower follow him and do what he wants us to do and he'll let us know he will let us know what he wants us to do we just need to be open receptive and just constantly be thanking him for who he is in our lives and just saying god what do you want me to do anybody have anything you'd like to share about what we talked about tonight did it speak to you in any particular way that you think it might um help you to Maybe if you've been discouraged about some things or whatever, you know, you, you saw these men, all of who, you know, were not the best and probably would not have received most of our votes if if we weren't. But and I don't know, you know, uh, when I was reading I, reading through this, I think if that was election, I couldn't know, you know, just based on what I read. And so anyway, it's... Uh, we just, uh, we, we just never know who's watching us, and that's, that's what's so important. Uh, that people can see Jesus in our lives. And, uh, and I think when we're like this, we're here for each other to always remember that. We're here for each other. And uh, we, should never, we should never go away from here feeling like, I, I feel really lonely. I don't have anybody that I can talk to. I don't have anybody to pray with. You know me? No, you do. You have, you have love here in this church, just like that, that uh, heart was on the door. So ones out there and in the parking lot right now that came up here one Wednesday night just because they were bored 
Mm -hmm. And they have been coming ever since then on Wednesdays and on Sunday nights. Those kids are eager so to learn. Much. And Sammy is Sammy is just doing a wonderful job with them out there. And we start so many times with the children. That's how, you know, my my parents weren't going to church and my aunt and uncle took me. And eventually my mom got saved, my dad got saved. Uh, and these little kids have adults, um, have family, have parents. And so we need to be praying for them. A lot of times we focus on the children and we don't think about what's going on with these families. And a lot of times when they know that you love them enough and you want to be there for them. That's who they turn to. People that, that they know can. Anybody else have anything to share? I appreciate your time, and uh, hopefully you'll think some of these things and probably laugh the next time you you uh, we start talking and somebody starts to mention the disciples and everything. You'll you'll keep in your mind some of the things that were said. So let's pray before we go. Father, we thank you so much for your word. We thank you for the call on the lives of these disciples. And uh, Lord, most of the time when we feel call a call, we're because we're a Christian. But Lord, we know that you're calling us to, and people who are not Christians, you're actually calling for them to come and hear your word and hear what is uh, the word of the Lord and and the, what what you have done, Jesus, to uh, help us to know what is the right way to live. Uh, you showed that when you were here on this earth and these disciples followed you. Unfortunately, one didn't make it. But dear God, we thank you for those others who have made an impact and are still being remembered today for the positive things that they did because you called them. Lord, I pray that you'd be with us as we go to our homes. pray that you would keep us safe for the rest of this week. Those who have had sickness in the family and among themselves and are facing um, operations and everything, pray that you would be with them. Help us to serve you in Jesus' name. Amen.